Vi har en sista talk idag. Um, I'm really happy to introduce Fara Kalantari. He, uh, if you lived in Oslo the past uh, 15 years, you've definitely seen Autopia. Uh, uh, been invited by email, by post, anyway, by uh, to his Autopia production. And uh, uh, Farad is um, Iranian American, based in Norway. He works primarily with film and video installations. He studied at San Francisco Art Institute, uh, and he's been um, widely exhibited in Norway and internationally. And he was the co-founder and artistic leader of Utopia in Oslo, which uh, was from 2003 to 2017. Uh, yes, please welcome Farad. I'm really happy he's here. Well, thank you all for being here. I've heard it's been a long day. I was late, I'm sorry. I had some technical problems as usual. Um, but it's nice to see that so many of you have stayed. Uh, I want to thank Lotta and Per and others who organized the event for inviting me here. Thank you. Um, what I am planning to do, how is the sound? Um, good? I'm going to talk about Atopia, give a bit of introduction to how and why Atopia um, was made, and then talk about a few of Atopia's projects, and then talk about Atopia's project concerning history of film and video art in Norway. <coughs> and uh, I will, my talk will be fragmented. I will jump back and forth. Fast forward, rewind, fast forward, rewind. In the middle of it, I will also talk about um, what? Video art, film, everything. Well, uh, as you know, Atopia is, was an artist initiative. That was the uh, most important element of Atopia in the beginning. We started Atopia in 2003. We were a group of friends who had just come to Oslo. And we kind of felt foreign, uh, outsider. We did not know many people. Not many people knew us. And we were missing. We were a group of artists. And we were missing a place where we can get together and talk about art. Screening programs were where what we were used to in bringing people together, where we, would, where, where we would screen works and then sit around and talk about it. So that was the initial kind of uh, idea for Atopia. Um, however, I have to mention that before Atopia, I was also um, working, had worked with other artist-run uh, spaces and artist initiatives. I studied in San Francisco, and there we had regular um, gatherings with artist friends who would get together, show some works, and try to talk about it. When I had a studio in Berkeley, my studio was a place where a lot of my artist friends would get together, and we would show each other our latest works, our latest uh, in kind of treasures, and try to talk about it. Even though we were mostly students, maybe we didn't really know the language to talk about the artworks, but we were trying. At some point, I remember one day, we, well, this event was uh, not organized, but just came together once in a while. And when we didn't have anything to talk about when nobody had made a new work. I remember one day we just sat around with drinking tea and eating cookies and we found a little line on the wall and we said that's what we will talk about today. So we put a masking tape around it and that became our kind of visual for discussion. Um, 
After that, I moved to London, where I started a group called Vida Vision in 97. And with this group, uh, I organized um, kind of public art projects. We received support from the Art Council of England. Uh, we rented a billboard in a neighborhood in London called Haringey. And then I invited a group of uh, friends and colleagues to send me their works, uh, mostly painting and photography, and we enlarged them to fit on the billboard and we tried to kind of emulate or call it public art. It was the space of advertising and we were trying to convert that into a space of art. Well, it was an early kind of attempt in uh, engaging with public art. But it is, I think, important because the same space of our, uh, advertising that we used for uh, you, photo and painting works were uh, at some point um, were used by artists uh, like um, David Hall, um, Valley Export to show video artworks for the first time. They, are, uh, they were using television as it is the place of advertisement and using it for uh, distribution or making art. Uh, then I moved to Trondheim and I had a studio at a place called Lademun Künstnerwerkstätter, a very amazing place. Uh, 34 artists have studios there. There are equipment workshops of all kinds that photo, uh, metal, carpentry, and not many people are using it. When I came there, I felt like I have moved into a, an art school there are no students. Everything is mine. All the equipment, I didn't have to wait for using anything. Gradually at um, Lademun, uh, my job became to set up a place for film, video, and digital photography. Uh, there were some computers, uh, there were some equipment, but um, I got this position stipend through Noshkultu Road as the uh, aspirant, and it is still, it's still continuing. But I was a free aspirant to set up the workshop, to set up a media lab. So I learned fundraising in the Norwegian way, the buying equipment, learning the equipment, getting all kinds of applications, setting up the <clears throat> even walls, putting carpet on the floor to make sure that we will have a proper workshop. And so my job was to learn, it, bring it together, learn it, and then teach it. And that's what I did for three years. Um, in 2001, when my first daughter was born, I somehow felt that Fronheim is too small for us. So we moved to Oslo. The place that we, uh, I helped to set up in Trondheim was called Top Floor. Today, it is running by uh, Espen Gangwijk, who calls it, uh, who turned it into another place and calls it Tex. And it is uh, doing a lot of exciting work, running a biennial of video art, uh, electronic art in Trondheim called Metamorph. So um, we came to Oslo. Again, foreign, again, um, not knowing anybody in this new city. Um, I told that part of the story already, didn't I? Uh, I'm not a good storyteller. So we came to set up Atopia as a place where we would gather, we would watch different types of work we had in mind in the beginning, but mainly um, film and video works. We rented a small place 
on the Lakka Gata. Let me see if I can show some pictures of that. That was our logo. Um, it took a while to make it. But the logo itself goes with the idea and the title goes with the idea of um, how we wanted to combine the ideas of foreignness with the characteristics of film and video that we call sometimes nomadic. Um, at the same time, we were dealing with some issues that were a little beyond our practice. We were going into politics of representation and some areas involved involving uh, philosophy of art. Um, we gave Atopia a kind of a conceptual framework that was trying to combine these two issues of film, uh, foreignness, and uh, how to deal with politics of representation. We borrowed ideas from thinkers like uh, Edward Said, Adorno, Gilles Deleuze, and mixed them up in to make some conceptual groundwork for Atopia. But the main idea, of the main attempt, main most of Atopia projects were surrounded around artists moving image works. Um, so how we talk about film and video sometimes as nomadic uh, media, in a way, it, uh, what explains is that characteristic of characteristic of film and video is explained by this idea of of it being an international medium or media as soon as we enter as soon as we start working with video or film we enter an international arena film and video works are uh, made locally but they are always in a, a dialogue in a reference to their international peers. We, for example, immediately after you make a film, you send it to international film festivals. We were also trying to, in my, especially in my case, trying to define the role of the foreign artist. What does a foreign artist do uh, in connection to the local population or in connection to this to his new home what is uh, expected of you uh, foreign artists especially when they are not from north america and western europe is that they will bring works they will bring ideas they will bring presence from their home country um, we don't expect them to get involved with the issues that are at the center of our art practice, let's say, in um, London or New York or Oslo. We want them to go back to their original country and enlighten us or be a representative of that kind of culture. That is one of the first uh, things that uh, I learned in terms of uh, dealing with a post-colonial situation not to do. Of course, I also have gone back to my old country and brought images and sounds from there. But I have tried to set up a new rule of how I, as, an, as a foreign artist, can contribute to the country where I am living. So I br try to bring in and I promote the idea 
of bringing in a foreign view on domestic uh, issues. So that was our first, uh, this idea was also part of Atopia, of course. That was the first uh, location that we found for Atopia. It was in Lakagata. And it was a small room, a shop front. And we thought, if we get support, fine. If we don't get support, we pay, we manage to pay the bills and continue working with very inexpensive projects. Who were we? If we get support, then we can do more expensive projects like inviting artists from other countries to come and uh, work with us, present their works in our place. For the first edition of Atopia, we decided to show our own works and just to say, to show who we are. Um, in the second edition, uh, we invited Alexander Riso um, for a sound performance. Then we started, but well, this was going on, small projects that we were running. Then we started with a new project that was very traditional or um, projects or what you, it's open screen, uh, open screening programs are very important in the history of um, artists, filmmakers. Places like London uh, Filmmakers Cooperative or similar in the US always had this kind of programs where you could bring in your works and uh, show it to a group of other friends and colleagues and have a discussion about it. So this was a project that we started in Atopia in January or February 2004. And we made it into a regular program. Bring your work, we show it, and we'll talk about it. We make you talk about it too. We ran this project almost 40 times uh, every month. And then gradually, we said every other month. Until 2012, I think, we were still working with it. So we got to know a lot of these young, new video artists who were coming there to use the setup as a tutorial for their works. And we were also learning. Um, we also set up workshops on video production and film production. And uh, then we, we moved on to a new project. While our discussions were going on in video forum and other areas, other projects, we noticed that th there is a set of references that we keep referring to, we keep going back to, but we don't have, um, we are not able to, because we're referring to a history of experimental film that we had learned in other countries, but those works had never been shown in Norway, so we couldn't expect anybody to relate to what we were saying. Therefore, we decided to set up a project where we would bring in uh, references and historically important works to establish, establish a ground for our references. We called it celluloid. And for most part, we um, rented the films, 16 millimeter films from UK and US and brought them here and showed them sometimes in other places. This work uh, was shown in this room. We worked with different institutions because we didn't have the proper place for showing, it's a, it's a double screen uh, film projection. We didn't have the place for it. Another one we went to uh, uh, Cinematheque. Um, oops, that was something else. 
Well, we went with, uh, with this project for a long time. And we, of course, we started with Maya Darren, who is uh, uh, the mother of all experimental film and filmmaking in the US. Um, after a while, I think it was 2007, uh, one of our friends, Greg Pope, started a program at Cinematheque where he kind of carried on this project. And we thought, that's enough. We, we go do something else. Uh, there are cinema, film, and video are, for some, are very narrow areas. But for us, there are so many branches that we can work with. So we stopped the project, uh, Celluloid. In 2007, we moved to a new location, and we started, based on that location, we started a new project called uh, Vitrine, and we set up uh, four windows of uh, Atopia's space to make video projections that you could see from the street. The, our street, Sannergata, was uh, did not have a lot of pedestrians, but a lot of cars were passing by. There was a bus stop right in front of our door. The first year of this project, we invited uh, colleagues and friends in Norway that, that were already working with video and we knew of their work. Um, oops. Maybe I should go to my... PDF file to so just going quickly through celluloid project yeah and the first year of the project was um, mostly uh, artists who were in Norway, but for the second year and the fi four years after that that we run this, we ran this project, we send out open calls and we received at least a hundred applications every year from around the world. Um, Wittreen, so was a place for experimenting with video art in public space. And we kind of, whether knowingly, knowingly or not knowingly, were pushing our boundaries. How far can we go before uh, somebody would break our window? It never happened. That was Jeremy's work. On the side of these projects that we had started and they were rolling, we also did other um, events and uh, exhibitions such as Salon of Experimental Film and Video Art, um, collaboration with some of our uh, video artist friends who were bringing works from other countries. Um, and then we, um, we moved to another location. I believe moving to any location gives you, me, or any institution, new inspirations. We get our inspiration from where we are. And this project is totally about that. We set up a project to explore the relationship of place and perception. How does... Um, uh, Oslo affect the way we make art. If you lived uh, in, let's say, another city in uh, Beijing, how would you uh, make art? How would you make it differently? We believe that there is a connection between place and perception. And this pro project was trying to explore that. We made a program from Tehran. Um, at first, we, 
for this project, we had a curator who was based in New York who was already working with video art in Iran to go and uh, make the program. In the second part of the program, uh, we had um, also Sao Paulo, and then we brought Mexico City and Seoul. In those cities, we decided that the curators who are contextualizing the video works that we are presenting should also be based in those cities, in Seoul and in um, Mexico City. So we were learning from our own experience and our own uh, mistakes. This was, of course, done by Michel Pavlou, one of our Atopia uh, founders. At the same time as traffic project, um, not traffic, um, vitrine project, in uh, 2007 or early not 2007, but in 2006, uh, we came up with an idea to work with history of film and video art in Norway. I will focus on history of film and video art in Norway, but this was also, I want to finish Atopia. This was also Atopia's last project. We set up a small place once we started losing our support. We set up a small place, uh, a studio where we invited artists and we made a plan for making um, colla collaborations to write our uh, art texts. We invited an artist to uh, do an, an in installation that was both indoor and outdoor. We had a window. We, in order to see it, you had to come and see it from outside. And <coughs> along with that, we also invited uh, another artist to be in charge of a text production in collaboration with the exhibiting artist. This project um, was what we did in the last year of Atopia in 2007. And we collected a lot of text. It's the text uh, is still with us, but we haven't published it. When Atopia ended in 2017, uh, many of its projects uh, remained incomplete. We had gathered all kinds of information. We had learned a lot of different things that we could have brought into some kind of a production or a book. But we just um, didn't get the opportunity to do that. And in October 2017, we decided to close down Atopia as fast as possible, as efficient as possible. In December 2017, it was closed. We made sure the Stira of Atopia, the board of Atopia, will not get into trouble because of our financial situation also. So back to history. I think that was Atopia. I will s try to say some things about the history of project, Atopia's project on history of film and video art in Norway. We know that medium is the message. We hear that everywhere. But I believe both medium and the message have a lot of other stories to tell us. Um, it bec when we talk about it, just medium is the message, message, what it, it closes down. How can we open the medium? Medium, uh, for a majority of video artists, or those who we call video artists, was, was television. A large number of artists who are credited as uh, founders, 
fathers, mothers of video art, they worked with television. Um, why don't we call that television art? What does that mean? They worked with television from 1960s when Namjoon Peck started in the States and then, let's say, uh, what's David Hall in the UK, um, Valley Export in Austria, um, they, all of them were referring to this medium called TV. Video at the time was not separated from television. Video existed only as TV. So we see a lot of them working with the television box, working with issues that are uh, related to broadcast TV, <coughs> issues that are uh, about broadcast TV, and uh, the culture around it. For example, um, um, let me not lose that idea. So, TV. I want to propose that uh, over the years, at some point, um, the scene of video art, the technology of video art, has branched out. It probably, in the early days, it was only TV. But at some point, maybe, uh, maybe it was around early, early 90s, late 80s, where video took itself out of TV, or we took video out of TV. Uh, so, I want to show you this video of David Hall. Interruption. Interruption. Those early David Hall pieces were all shot in 16 millimeters, they weren't video at all. <laughs> yes. Well, all of these, um, probably Valley Export did the same thing. They were made as film, uh, not video. But then, this is, this is one of my favorite works of David Hall. It uh, relates to issues that are inside the television set, inside the experience of viewing a TV. This work was made uh, and broadcast in Scottish TV in 1972. Um, and uh, like Jeremy said, it was made or on 16 millimeter film. He was using a Bolex camera to shoot these. He made seven of them. Uh, th as a series. Um, at the same time, this is happening in uh, in the UK, 1972. Um, Valley Export is doing something similar, reflecting to the culture around television in 1971. In Austria, it was broadcast, her film. And um, what was happening in Norway at that period? Before I get to that, let me go back to uh, medium is the message. I say med there are a connection there that I now I'm saying the, the medium has changed its shape. It, was, it is no longer television. It is video, and video has broken the box, and it's out there. It takes sculptural, it takes architectural forms, not the box, but the image itself. Image ha has become something that they could never imagine. Uh, but somehow, it took a long time to break that or to realize that and start using that. Um, 
on, on the other side, the message. They say, okay, the medium is the message. What is the message? The message, as um, it started in, in the States, unregulated in the beginning. The message was um, advertisement. Um, in Europe, the message was regulated. The um, governments owned the monopoly of broadcast TV, and the message was more of a political, cultural propaganda. Uh, for a advertisers, they thought television is the most uh, influential, most powerful tool for persuasion. And they used the same technique for cultural and political persuasion. If we look at the history of how it developed, we see, for example, that um, television in the beginning was limited to a number of hours every day, even though they had the possibility of showing more, more programs. But they would cut it between 6 and 7 in the evening to say, this is the time you put your kids to bed. At 11 o'clock, they would cut it and say, now you go to bed. You're going to work tomorrow. Yeah? On Sundays, they would stop during the time that People are supposed to go to the church. Um, so this is cultural propaganda. It, it is shaping the way uh, we become as a nation, as a community. Um, but when it comes to artists, we, a lot of us talk about uh, carrying a message, saying something, making a point. Message is written in text. It's text-based. But why do we care to bring that message into form of video or audio? I think the majority of artists who are dealing with this issue are using message as an excuse to work with the medium, to develop it, to bring it forward, even if they don't know it. So this, hap this is happening in uh, UK. What is happening in Norway? By the way, <laughs> the reference to this, the, the reference of this work, I remember that I made up this card that sometimes the um, the signal will, would break in the TV station, and they would be worried that uh, now people are going to turn it off or do something or retune it. And then they would put up a card like this. This is what David Hall is kind of referring to in saying interruption, I think. Yeah? Don't touch your receiver. The signal is returning. The programming is coming back. Uh, now we have this one. So we started the retrospective project in 2007, working with the idea of history of film and video art in Norway. It was not done before. The works were scattered around the country. They were not collected before. And we wanted to see everything. To begin with, um, we went to uh, talk with different institutions and see who is going to help us with this. One of the th first meetings we had with the National Museum, they said that they are interested, they want to do a similar project, but uh, such a project should have the collection of the National Museum as the central part of the exhibition. And we said, you don't have a collection. So that's the whole idea. We're doing it. And of course, those artists are very important in this scene. They are pillars of video art. They knew Jeremy Welch, they knew Shel Bjorgang, and they knew Marianne Heska. But we were interested in looking, the other, looking for the others, the ones who were not present, the ones who were neglected, the ones who lived in a small town and made video or film, but 
they were never collected. Or we were trying to democratize the idea of history. So we left the National Museum uh, without a contract and, and without an agreement. Then we went to Stenishan Museum. Stenishan Museum had three floors for exhibition. The two lower floors had no windows, and we thought this is perfect. Ceiling was a bit low, but that didn't matter. And at the time, the director of the museum was Selena Went, and she accepted us, invited us with open arms, and gave full support to make this project happen. So that is uh, what we were working for about four or five years, collecting these works, going to individual artists, going to all kinds of uh, collections, like we knew Henny Unstar had some collection or a list of works. We knew National Museum had some. We knew mm, National Library had some. And they were all helpful. But we also sent out open calls. We contacted all the artist centers around the country. And at times, we went to specific artists that we were told by a friend or a colleague that, oh, yeah, she has some work, but she doesn't dare to come forward. We went to meet a film artist, too. Well, Norway did not have that kind of an experimental film that we were used to seeing in UK and in the US. But there was something kind of similar to it, equivalent. And that was um, what Gunnar Iversen, who is a professor in um, Trondheim Academy, calls it uh, personal uh, poetic cinema. So we collected those works with the help of National Library. And we kind of, we went, we went they were an older generation. We went to meet them, and one of them um, said, Yes, there was, he was very enthusiastic in taking part in this project, but we did not have authority. You know, we were just a few uh, people, artists, who were doing this big project that usually a museum should do, and the museum would call the artist and say, hello, I'm calling from the museum, and I want to collect you, see your work. That's a different thing compared to saying, hello, I'm Farad, I'm coming to, to see you and talk about your work. They somehow needed to trust us before we can work with them. One of them gave us all the, he, has, he had DVDs, gave it to us, and the next day he sent a message saying he doesn't want to take part in it. OK, we had done something wrong. So we found out through his friends called the institutions that he was actually in contact with, and we found out that he was um, annoyed that I only spent two hours with him. So I made an appointment, again, went there and spent the whole day with him. And he got my trust and gave us the works. Um, because maybe he had to. He, uh, they were neglected, so uh, maybe that's why. We set up uh, the exhibition with collecting and digitizing, and uh, then came the idea of making a book. Uh, the book has a long story itself. Uh, we invited ri writers both from inside Norway and from abroad. Some of the writers that we knew and we really wanted them to take part, to join the project, said they don't have time. So we found some others who could work with us, who could trust us and work. Because again, there you have the issue of, well, this is an artist-run organization. Um, even though artist-run organization is total freedom, we did whatever we wanted to do. And we got support. Noshkultur Road was the main sponsor of Atopia. But for this project, we got support from a lot of other institutions because they knew that this is important and 
the National Museum, who's supposed to take care of this, has not done its job. But that was a window of opportunity for us. We knew they had a, it was a failure, but we turned that failure into something positive, and we made this uh, kind of a, uh, original narrative on the history of film and video art in Norway. Uh, the book is here. The I got a few minutes. Okay. Five minutes, I think. <laughs> the book is here. I have a few copies of it if you like to get one. Um, just let me know. Uh, Retrospective was the title of the exhibition. I have two videos I want to show you. And I only have five minutes left. You only have five minutes. I think Hitler is so often, so I think we have to do five I'll minutes. show you a combination of the two. Oops. A documentation of the uh, exhibition we had at the Stenshin Museum, 2011. Christine Bargest, Merita Morgan Stierna, Christine. Eric Borga, 1952. Camilla Varenschild, she was here earlier. This is a video installation of, that he had, TV. This is the, the book, and next thing we did was the exhibition went on around different countries, and it was shown in different formats, and then we made a highlight of the exhibition so we can show it in different f uh, film festivals. But I want to leave you with a work that r goes back to what, what I was trying to say. This thing is happening in England. This thing is... Uh, in America, this is happening in Austria. What is happening in Norway? This is happening in Norway. This is 1967 on NRK TV. So you know what it is now. It's one short piece is gives you the clue of what kind of a work it is and can you call it video art or not. But the important thing is that this was made in 1966 by Rolf Omot. Today he's an 85-year-old artist living in Bergen. He is still with us. And it was never mentioned in any of the books on history of video art in Europe. Why? Because, why? <laughs> <laughs> that is a failure of uh, the Norwegian scene not taking care of its own artists. Uh, that is an area that we have tried to address and we have tried to uh, 
help. Thank you very much.